Knickerbocker fans, it's been a couple days, but today I bring on a professional to discuss what's going on with them Knicks. Let's do it, New York City. Nick fans, I I don't enjoy seeing you guys go through what you're going through. It's been six years of not making the playoffs. And I don't think it's entertaining to come in on, on nights that y'all lose and try to clown the team. I don't think that's a productive conversation to be having about another New York City sports team. Now, banter is banter. You, you, you're you going to have your jokes. And the Nets have given the Knicks fans plenty of things to joke about uh, over the years. We, we are the perpetrators of the single worst trade in NBA history. Uh, and to which we accredit Mr. Sean Marks a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of accolades for for pulling us out of kind of, but the job is not done. Uh, and I digress. With today, I'm bringing on a gentleman uh, from a show that I first got a chance to look at from the perspective of just being a basketball fan. I wanted to go on there and hear hear what they had to say and laugh at the 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 Knicks bias. But I I found something different. I found uh, a group of cats who put together a format that I think is unique in in, in NBA uh, uh, social media. And I personally uh, uh, think their format is is right. So then the second time I was looking at them, I was looking at them from the perspective of uh, potentially someone who would participate at the the QNYC incubator and... um, for those who who are coming on for the first time, I am not a professional NBA pundit. I'm a software engineer who started a little tech company, and um, I sold it. and 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 I'm a kid from Brooklyn who did good. I'd like to be able to do that for others. And, and one of those people I think that I'll be working with in the future is from a gentleman from Knicks Fan TV. Why don't you come on and and uh, introduce uh, yourself to the to the people? Uh, salute to everybody out there listening. Happy holidays. Um, salute to Eve, and thanks for having me on. Uh, once again, this is CP from Knicks Fan TV, uh, a show where we, we just let the fans be heard and let the fans have their opinions on, on the team. We, we cover Knicks news. We interview uh, uh, Knicks fans, you know, celebrity fans, former players, and, and we do post-game live streams after every game where we break down each, each game. Uh, this season seems like each loss. Uh, and, and then we take phone calls from the fans, man. So it's been a budding brand, and, and we just uh, look forward to the continued growth. So thanks for having me on, man. Nah, man, kudos to you. And um, uh, I, I, I uh, you know, you already know I'm a fan of your format. Um, I think the, the next stage of, of uh, sports entertainment is going to look a lot like more like what you guys do versus what is done on ESPN. Um, obviously that has its audience. There's people who like that, but, uh, uh, the way people consume sports are changing and we don't even know how to measure it right now. Uh, um, but I, I, I gotta ask, like, how did you come up with your format? How did, how did, uh, how did you decide upon the way you, uh, uh, execute creating content? Well, I would say it came from um, several different uh, uh, inspirations. Um, number one, I, I was a WFAN 660 head from mm-hmm. the time I can remember. I used to go, um, remember when they used to have Take Your Kid to Work Day, and I used to go with my dad into work, and he was an elect- electrical engineer, and they used to work right across the street from the garden at, wow. at, uh, at one Penn Plaza, 11 Penn Plaza, sorry. That's and, history. Um, I used to go in there, and they used to have – they used to have the radio on, and when you listen to the radio, you just hear these two guys yakking back and forth, back and forth, arguing mm-hmm. about sports. And I used to be like, what is this? 
And my dad used to be like, yeah, this is Mike and the Mad Dog. You know, we just have it on just to get us through the day. Mm. And from those times, I just used to be hooked on that show and just hooked on sports radio format and the passion that that it brought out of New Yorkers. No matter the sport or no matter the team, just, you know, just all New Yorkers just have that common uh, passion for their teams and, and speak so eloquently about it at times. So you had that in terms of the sports radio format, and that's how we have our um, live callers for the shows. Yeah. But then also from a YouTube standpoint, um, I took a liking to uh, the fan channels for the Premier League teams, in mm. particular Arsenal Fan TV. Uh, you have United Stand for Manchester United, Full Time Devils for Manchester United, uh, and just how they would cover their team yeah. and, and really bringing the passion out of, of their fan base whether they would do post game, um, you know, live interviews with the fans, mm -hmm. or they would do match breakdowns, watch alongs, things of that nature. I was just really um, enamored with their style, and I just said, if there was ever a way, if there was ever a market to emulate that, it would have to be New York. Yeah. And, and so, as you were saying, uh, the media consumption is a bit different these days, especially with the new generation. Mm -hmm. This is more the highlight generation. Uh, you're seeing fans like Knicks fans. They're just tired of um, the the knocks from the ESPNs. You right. know the limited coverage of the ESPNs. Even MSG, yeah, you'll you'll get a 30 minute uh, pregame or 30 minute postgame show, but after that, it's all gone. There's no on demand content. No one is is uh, going to the fans for their opinions on things. Everyone seems to just be pushing out their content, but not really pulling in the fans and, and I feel like that's the most important one of the most important elements of the game yeah. uh, with, without the fan support these, these sports wouldn't have these multi-million dollar you know TV network deals and so on and so forth so I just felt it was important to, to capture the pulse of the fan base uh, after each game and, and that's how we you know continue to grow you know you you know I'm a fan so um I'm I'm really honored that you would come on and uh and uh talk to my little audience of uh, of hoop fans but let's let's move on. Let's let's talk about the Knicks. Uh, there, I've had a hard time. You know, the in, the the intent of the show was to cover both uh, uh, city teams, you know, equally good and bad. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do it with you know people that I knew and and people who I talk you know basketball with. And the challenge has been dudes are 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 heartbroken after these games and they, they don't really want to come on your podcast after watching these games. There's such a strong emotional connection to the Knicks that, um, you know, you got to ask, uh, like how, how, how's the fan base out there? Can tell me about where the fan base is at as a group? Yeah. Well, listen, I would say, I would say you, you you're always going to have your pocket of, loyal fans like myself that will watch this team every game inside and out, knowing that the, the prospects of a particular season aren't going to be that great, that you're probably not going to make the playoffs, but you, but you're still watching the team because that's your team. Like, you know, right. the, you, you know, nothing else but that. And if you're a basketball fan and you love your team, you're going to stick with it. Then you have your, your elements of more casual fans who are probably diehards in the nineties who, are you know disenfranchised with the, with the direction of the team right now, and and they'll they'll watch from a from a bird's eye view, but they're really not going to get back into it until this team really starts to turn the corner. Right. And then of course you you'll you'll have your, your elements that are are really just bandwagons. You know they they'll follow the hottest teams or the hottest players, but uh, from the Knicks standpoint, they probably won't come back around on, until uh, you know maybe playoffs time. From my perspective, from the channel, I thought when the whole free agency thing, when the whole thing really just collapsed mm -hmm. and, and we didn't get KD, we didn't get Kyrie or any superstars, I really feared how, you know, what, what the response was going to be to the channel. I was like, damn, I'm about to lose subscribers, I'm about to lose viewers, but it, it really went the opposite way. We've, we've gotten more viewers and, and more loyal um, listeners because – people feel like that is their outlet to still vent. You know, the people that are still around, they feel like in Knicks fan TV is their outlet to still vent, win or lose. And so, you know, we, we've uh, kind of benefited from it. It's like politics because uh, there's a phenomenon in, in news media where if Obama's in office, Fox News ratings goes, you know, through the charts because 
people want to hear on the daily, like how we're going to get Obama out the, out of office. Right. The same thing you're seeing MSNBC and CNN who have to share uh, a, a political leaning side. Um, you know, they they uh, do very well under the Trump era. And um, and it's just because people want to uh, a sounding board or 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 some form of con- of, of content that appeases their grief. Um, you know, do you feel responsible to be more upbeat in terms of looking towards the future? Or do you feel more, uh, that it's your responsibility to tell your, your, your fan base a a real analysis, even if it's something that they don't want to hear? No, our, our whole intention when we started this was just to be our, our authentic selves, you know, whether we're we're entertaining for a live stream or we're just talking in the barbershop. You know, mm-hmm. if, if the team played well on a given night, we're going to give them their kudos. It, it's not we don't make anything indicative of the future. We just talk about that game and that particular night and who played well, who didn't play well. If the team hasn't been playing well for a couple of games, we're going to point out the player that hasn't been playing well or has David Fisdale, you know, the things that he did that we may have questions on. So I, I think we, we give credit where it's due and, and we criticize or we question where it's due. Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, definitely the way you need to look at things. Um, so tell me, how did we get here? How did the Knicks end up where they are? Who, who is to blame? for this situation? Oh, man, there's many, many hands in the pot. I think this has been uh, 20 years of mismanagement, starting with the trade of Patrick Ewing. I think, sure, you can you can blame James Dolan to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. I think once we got past uh, that late 90s team, early 2000s team, that team was really never rebuilt properly. If you look at it, hey, Charlie Ward was the last Knicks rookie to be extended to his second contract. I mean, that should tell you all you need to know, and that was almost 20 years ago. Right. Almost 20 years ago. And in between that time, as the team languished, they continued to try to make the box office splash, the the Antonio McDice trade, you know, trading for a guy who – uh, hadn't even played many games the season before that due to a uh, uh, devastating knee injury. And you give up a first-round pick, who was Nene at the time, to bring him in. McDyess only plays a handful of games for the Knicks, and that was all she wrote. Yep. They continue to lose, and then they mortgage the future again for Stephon Marbury. Okay, I, I, was, I was ecstatic when Steph came. You know, I, I loved it. The prodigal son coming home. He was, he was New York City basketball. And I was excited. I was also a Penny Hardaway fan. And even though Penny didn't have it back then, I was just happy to have him see him in a Knicks uniform. But, yeah. you know, again, those moves, when, when you mortgage in your future and you, you're, you're hamstringing your, your salary cap, those things set you back. Yeah. When, when, when Steph's era passed, okay, you struck out on LeBron, but then you bring Amari in with no insurance on his knees. So you take one max contract and put that together. Mm. You... you, you you jump the you, you jump the gun early, uh, and panic and and package up your your future assets for Melo, where we don't know if he was he was threatening to go to Brooklyn. You know this, yeah. And whether we would have waited it out to the end of the season, try to sign him outright. Okay, that was a gamble that I don't necessarily blame Dolan for, but again, it didn't work. Because yeah, you had two guys on a max contract, one guy who was completely useless from an injury standpoint. And then you basically have to patch the rest of the team around them, uh, and it just didn't work. And so they kept doing those things, kept doing those things, to, and which would set them back. And so now we're here in present day, uh, finally trying to rebuild the team. But with all the losing that has transpired over the years, it just makes it seem a lot worse. See my brother. You know what I mean, it makes it seem a lot worse. Let me let's hold on right there, and we're gonna take a little break. And when we come back, we're gonna talk about how we how the Knicks are gonna fix this. Hold tight with me.
So we're back. We're talking your New York Knickerbockers, a team that doesn't just represent uh, New York City. New York, the Knicks, uh, unlike the Nets, are a uh, New York State's team. And if uh, they represent so many people and so many people who care they uh, uh, about this team, uh, follow this man, my man CP, who's on uh, the line with me. We're we're talking the team, man. And when we were uh, over, you just gave us a history of all of the things that have happened uh, that has got us here. Where where are we? Def- could define for the audience. You know where do the Knicks stand right now, and 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 you know what's the opportunity for them? Yeah. Yeah, so right now we're we're in the middle of the a proper full rebuild, right? I, I think if you if you take a look at it from a macro view, uh, last year they went into the draft, they they pulled out Kevin Knox, who it still seems like some sort of somewhat of a project. You know, the verdict is still out on him. Um, um, they hit the lottery with Mitchell Robinson, obviously a, a second round pick who uh, many teams have passed over, but certainly one of the more uh, up-and-coming impact players in the league. And then they were able to uh, sign Alonzo Trier, who's an undrafted free agent. Uh, this year they came in, they got R.J. Barrett with the third pick of the draft. Obviously, R.J.'s coming on strong. He, he's right up there in the rookie of the year um, standings. And then in the second round, they, they were able to pick up Ignace Brasdakis. So I think right now we're, we're, in, we're in the process of a rebuild. We, we had the cap space last summer to try to make a splash as you know <laughs> well as a mm-hmm. next fan you know well but listen we we lost we mm-hmm. we lost out on the big targets katie Kyrie, Kawhi leonard you name it we lost out and so we had to take that money and, and try to uh p- pair these young guys up with some solid veteran talent mm. and it just doesn't seem like the, the the guys that we got right now are really contributing to making this team better. Now, David Fizdale has been on the hot seat in in that regard to, to our slow start, which we kind of expected. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a lot of these guys, the, the Julius Randles of the world, Marcus Mars, yeah, individually they're, they're pretty good talents, but collectively it, we, it's yet to be seen whether or not this team can really gel. Because theoretically so- you have a lot of these guys – on so, one year deals. So let me so let me so jump in. Really, yeah, let, yeah, me, yeah. let me let me jump in there. I I uh mm-hmm. that's something that I want to wanted to bring up and the most mm-hmm. puzzling part of what they're doing right now is the guys that they signed, right? They're not mm-hmm. pieces the, of the future because they're only on one and two year deals and, and actually they're really one year deals with an option. And Right. And those and like for me, I don't know if it's better for the Knicks that they lose, right? If they're gonna lose, that they lose doing it with Kevin Knox getting beat up, but getting better yeah. for 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 thirty six minutes. I don't know if if it's better that they lose with uh, you know Taj Gibson having a a fifteen point night or Mitchell Robinson learning to just discipline himself so that he could play big minutes and that he could be trusted at the end of games. I, I, I just, I just don't see the value of of um, putting those guys even for one year a- in front of those kids. What, what would you say to that? Yeah. Well, I would say for one, I mean, they had so much cap space that they had to meet a certain threshold uh, in, in terms of how much they had to spend. So they had to spend the money anyway, right? They went out, they got a guy with, let's say, I, I still believe Julius Randle still has upside. He, he's 24 years old, uh, coming off of his best season of the year with, with the Pelicans, and I still think there's room for him to grow. Obviously, as the number one option on this team, his flaws have been uh, uh, really magnified because he has to be the number one guy. So he's getting all the attention, he's drawing all the double teams, and he doesn't look good, but let's just be honest. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, it, it, there's a fine balance between uh, winning and development and what's the proper way 
to develop these kids? Is it going to be behind sitting behind, you know, all these veterans or is it going to be having them be more of, um, you know, in the forefront and, and with the veterans being more of a supporting role? To me, I've, I've said this quite a few times. As the owner of a team and you go into free agency and your president and your GM are selling you on a path forward, on a plan forward, you're going to want to see the, the guys that you just signed. You're going to want to see them live in the minutes. I think that's just natural mm. for, for, for a time, right? And then there's going to come a point in time where they're going to have to figure out, okay, at what point do we try to trade some of these guys? At what point do we move Kevin Knox forward and, and dial back Marcus Morris's minutes if he's still here? You know what I mean? Yeah. So no, they're going to have to figure it out. I – I have a – like, I, I I watch every minute of every Knicks game all year. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm I I'm that bought into just basically making a, a, a good analysis. And, and I can't stand – because I'm looking at Marcus Morris, and he's like – he's just one of those hungry dudes. Like, you could just see it that, you know, mm-hmm. he, he's he's playing for his next contract. And just from the way he handled free agency with the Spurs and all that, I I just know he's a go for self type yeah. of cat. And I don't know if that's the cat that like I would have like if you don't mind, humor me and and let me give mm-hmm. you my proposal. Right, I mm-hmm. would have in the summer I would have used cap space as a weapon. The moment right. I didn't sign anybody, I'd be like. Who needs to get cap space off their books? I'll I'll t- I'll eat that in order to uh uh for a first round pick. Because I think the best thing that could ever happen to the Knicks is if they just had lots of lo- lots of bullets in the gun and they just shot mm-hmm. it every time and cuz they don't make bad picks. If I if I would say one of the the things that I like about the Mills Perry uh, uh, regime has been some of their picks. I, yeah, so I, far, so far the two for two. Right, I I, I think that I think I'm talking, and especially in the late round, I, I I think I think the kid in the G League with the name I can't pronounce uh, mm-hmm. has some game potential, and obviously Mitchell Robinson is a home run. So I. I would rather arm those guys instead of just bringing in old players who, who like, I'm, I'm sorry, they're human. Basketball players are human beings. You're talking about rich, yeah. satisfied human beings. Like, I, I'm, I'm looking at Kyrie Evans. Like, who's gonna, uh, Kyrie Irving on the Nets? Who's gonna tell Kyrie what to do? Like, when, when people bring up Kyrie, it's like, it, it's such a non-conversation because, of course, the superstar is gonna have sway. Melo had sway at the Garden. Um, you know, Darren Williams, unfortunately for us, had sway sway at Barclays. It's just the the game. But at the same time, do you want to give that sway to Marcus Morris? Because I, I almost yeah. would rather see uh, uh, R.J. Barrett shoot 24 times and just learn what he can and can't do on a basketball court, what he needs to add to his bag, and then – on top of it, just adding young players around him and just make him the de facto leader. Like you, he wants to be. So if I were the Knicks, I would have just used cap space as a weapon, just gathered up as much draft picks as I possibly could, and and just I, I mean not tank my way out of it, but build a foundation of just young, you know, pit bulls that's just running around yeah. on the court without a leash. I I think. I think that's when the Knicks are the most scary as as someone whose team has to play them. When the Knicks are just, you know, like at the end of the games that we've played with y'all, they, you guys come back because when you just start firing, when you guys just play, I think that's when you guys are the most dangerous. Why not let the kids just go through that? I, I don't know, you know. Agreed. Wow. I, I definitely agree. And as you said, when you bring in a bunch of guys, human nature kicks in, right? When you bring in right. a bunch of guys on technically one-year deals, right? Uh, it's hard for you to expect this team to come together. It's hard for you to expect guys to sacrifice. It's hard for you to expect guys to just, you know, dial it back and and assume a different role than what they're used to. Right. Uh, financially, it, it's hard to to fathom, and and just psychologically, it's hard to fathom. Uh, but I still think at the end of the day it was a smart move by them to do so to continue to keep the cap flexible. 
know, mm-hmm. you don't want to to lock in Wayne Ellington to a three or four year deal Absol- or lock in any of these guys. So Absolutely even even not. Randall, <laughs> you you bought yourself an extra year to kind of as kind of a tryout. You know, yeah. how does this guy fit in with us? He's still a young guy. Can we make him better? Um, and, and so on and so forth. I think, you know, Marcus Morris. Well, let, let's go back to, to trading for the cap I definitely agree with. I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, at the same time, there were only but so many moves that were made this off season because there are a lot of teams with cap space. Right. The Mo Harkless deal was the one I really wanted because number one, he's a guy that could have helped us, especially on the defensive end. New York and guy again, a New York guy, St. John's product, mm-hmm. and again, we could have gotten the the. the we could have gotten a draft pick. We could have gotten a serviceable player and a hometown kid. That was the deal I would have looked at. And also, I think the way the Morris thing kind of shook out late, maybe they would have done some things differently had they had the opportunity to get him early in the process rather than later. Here's it just the- seemed as though once they struck out on KD, they already had these guys uh, at the negotiating table where as soon as they lost out, they basically had signed these guys the very next day. Yeah, here here's what was what I went on um uh uh Evan Roberts podcast and said mm-hmm. I I had said trade use the cap space to trade for picks to take back back bad contracts um and then on top of it sign D'Angelo Russell. I think D'Angelo mm-hmm. Russell's effect on on these young guys, like first of all, he makes the the game easier for the people who play around him. He, he's he's got amazing court vision. He's only 23 years old. He would have been the best point guard on on the Knicks and he's a personality where he attracts other players. Like his like he's D'Angelo's one of those everybody's best friend dudes in the NBA. And uh and because he's so well like he could have he could have recruited another young superstar, you know, a la Cat, Cat Williams. I mean Cat Williams. <laughs> a la um Carl Anthony Towns, uh, the big cat. Uh uh, you know, you know when his deal can, comes up. So, I, what, what do you think about maybe uh, they they could have gone after someone like D'Angelo Russell? What, what did you think about that um, in the summer, and what do you think about it now? Because some people's uh, minds have been yeah. changed. Oh yeah, and I'm I'm one of them. You know, <laughs> in the summer, I was I was foolish enough to say, well, why pay D'Lo all that money when you could continue to develop Dennis Smith Jr. and Frank Nilakina, and obviously. I think Frank can still be a positive uh, impact player, a winning player on this team down the road. DSJ, yeah. I'm just not so sure because he just, I'm not sure whether it's a, a physical setback, a mental setback, but he, he's really struggling this year. And conversely, you know, D'Angelo, give credit to him. He really, he's really grown up, you know, after that Lakers fiasco with the recording players in the locker room yeah. and, and Magic shipped him out quickly, comes to Brooklyn, has a resurgence on a Kenny Atkinson, and and now is certainly having uh, an all star season with the Warriors, man. So yeah. the Angels definitely lighting up. He definitely could have been a great pairing with RJ. But uh, you know, uh, looking forward to the draft where where you have a lot of point guard prospects. You have Lamelo oh. Ball. You have uh, you know uh, a combo guard and Anthony Edwards. Uh, you have Cole Anthony. You know, you have a lot of point guard. I front, feel like. So. I feel like you guys can't mix. You guys can't miss this year. Like you could only, <laughs> you can only mess it up with the talent that I'm seeing. Like they slept on this draft. This draft at the top, yeah. and, and watch the damn um, Golden State Warriors. Warriors are going to win the win draft. It. Win it. They cannot wouldn't that, win it, man. Would, wouldn't I'm that be like man. the most evil thing that could ever happen? Is the Golden State Warriors I- win this draft? <laughs> I would not be surprised, man. The the Warriors right now are executing the perfect tank season, development tank. Yeah. And they're going to pull off a heist in this draft. They got Steph on ice. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure he could come back from that hand injury. They got Clay on ice right now. D'Angelo's doing his thing. You have the kid out of Villanova that's been been playing very well for them. Yeah. And I just would not be surprised if they if they win this lottery, get another stud. And get ready to roll for for uh, the twenty twenty season. Life's not fair, man. <laughs> Life's I'm not fair. You, well, enough about them, um, and enough about the past. And you know, mm-hmm. let let's talk about who's the player for right now that 
uh, gives you the most hope? Give if you had to oh, single out one guy. Yeah, it's it's RJ, no doubt about it. Um, the, the kid has come in and just been uh, just just fearless, yeah. just fearless, and and not afraid of the moment. You know, obviously he comes in with flaws. We know his jumper is not efficient. We know that his free throw shooting has been horrendous. But there's so many aspects to his game that you like. You know, his aggressiveness, the ability to get to the line, uh, the ability to be ambidextrous in terms of how he finishes. I think his defense has been pretty commendable at the NBA level thus far. Mm -hmm. Uh, The way that he can be uh, a productive facilitator on the wing if you need him to be. I I think RJ's come in and played uh, at a very high level this early. And like I said, obviously you have none from Miami Heat. You have uh, uh, John Morant, who's certainly leading in the rookie race, but but RJ's right there with him, man. So RJ got a lot of Duke in him. Me... <laughs> he, oh, yeah. he, he's got a lot. <laughs> he's got a lot of Duke, uh, a lot of Duke ways. Uh, uh, if, if if I had to explain it that way, and, and you want to know what you want that, uh, whatever it is, uh, shashevsky has got going on down there. He's he's got a lot of winning going on, and. And you could see he 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 wants to be that lead dog. He wants to be the yes. alpha. Is he a number mm-hmm. one? Is he a number one on a championship team? Is he a number two? Is he even a number three on a championship? Where where do you see him in terms of the uh, of what the Knicks need going forward? Ceiling wise, I think he could definitely be at least a three. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got to see how the rest of his game rounds out in, in the coming years. I think he could definitely be a three. He just has that dog in him, man, and and he has that pedigree, like you mentioned, um, being under uh, under Coach K, playing for the Canadian National League. His both of his parents basketball players growing up in the city. Mm-hmm. Uh, his father St. John's product. You have Steve Nash, who's his golf father. The, the kid was just well groomed um, for this, and and again, being under the the brightest lights, man. We yeah. always say the Knicks jersey is the heaviest jersey and i just love his poise coming in so far as a rookie and even though again yes he has his flaws i think he his heart and his mental fortitude is what's really going to make him a great player you know even the disappointments you know you had you had Kyrie hit him catch him with a step back jason tatum catch him with some game winners i think he's just going to continue to learn from those and, and be a big piece for this town if um if he if that's who RJ is, what is mm-hmm. Mitchell Robinson? What is Mitchell Robinson? You know, what's his ceiling, and what's his future with the Knicks? What's his role on, on the Knicks? Besides Mitchell, the Mitchell obvious, w- besides the yeah. obvious that he's the center, right? He's the future right. starting five. But but what what is he for the Knicks? Where where does he fit in? Well, well, where like, Mitch is your anchor. You know, Mitch is, is your anchor. He's going to protect the paint. He's going to hold it down for you. Uh, when you get a better point guard situation, when you get a more capable point guard, he's going to be your finisher, finishing on the lobs, the offensive rebounds, the putbacks. I don't know if his game will ever move outside of three feet. I'm not sure. You know, he you, you do see him shoot. We, we, try to, we try to bestow the mid-range Mitch moniker on him <laughs> if he would ever just let it fly. But right now, he's just going to be the finisher for us. And I think once we get better point guard play, I think once he himself sets better screens. He's a lobs and dunks center. Yeah. That like. Absolutely. And and the responsibility is on the coach to get him lobs and dunks. And I I, that's that's my frustration with his development uh, under um. Fisdale is Fisdale. that mm-hmm. you've got to have plays. I, I think I think Frank can run can run those plays. I think I think Dennis Smith should be able to run those plays. This just the simplest thing. Get him moving. Throw him lob. You could throw him lob so high that you know nobody's going to be able to defend it. I I, I really don't yeah. understand why that's not a part of of what they do. Can he be a leader for your team? Does he have? Is, is his his basketball IQ is in question, um, you know, because mm-hmm. he can't be played uh, for significant minutes. He stays in foul trouble. His decision making uh, for a second year pl- player is uh, not where it should be. Uh, you know, is he? Does he have the, the the mental capacity to be a leader on this team? 
Well, that's a good question. That's 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 a million dollar question, and it's left to be seen. I think he's shown it, uh, but again, durability and discipline have been my two keys for for Mitch. And he has that build where the durability is always going to be in question, but the discipline has got to be better. Especially, I look back to the Nets game just recently. You know, he picks up, he fouls out of the game, and and because there was just so many, uh, I, two or three of the fouls were just so undisciplined and unnecessary that part of it costs us a game. And, and upon fouling out, he ends up picking up a technical foul. But I think that also comes with just being a young kid. I mean, he's, he's extremely young, uh, extremely green, still a project. But I give credit to the Knicks for trying to put the veterans around him to kind of help him get through that. You know, you, you saw DeAndre Jordan in here last year. He didn't stay. But Taz Gibson, I love that acquisition. I, I definitely love that acquisition. For green. For Mitch. For Green and and hopefully I would he's one of the pieces that I would like to keep here on his on the second year of his deal mm -hmm. just to continue that um, you know that mentorship for Mitch because I think Taj is, is certainly one of the leaders on this team. Uh, I, definitely, definitely. I, uh, Taj Gibson is a guy that I thought if the Nets you know have being capped out with their signings, you know could have bought in a, a kid from Fort Green. Brooklyn through and through, but he's a Nick fan. You know that I, I credit him for for uh, being a diehard, and um, you know you need those type of guys. Like I I, I always go back to Rashi Wallace when he played with those um, mellow teams. You couldn't even measure what he did on the court. Like he he'd have decent right. numbers on, on for the amount of minutes that he played, but it really just was, you know. That's somebody you sometimes you just need other players who could tell your superstar shut the fuck up. <laughs> like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I I think mm -hmm. I think I think Rashid was the type of dude that when Melo needed it and, and Chauncey Billups as well, I think that's why Melo mm -hmm. had his most success with Chauncey Billups. You know, you you needed that guy on the team that could just look at you and be like, Ah, oh, Melo, I'm, you know, fuck that superstar shit shut the fuck up yeah you know yeah. And, and as a result Melo finished third in the mvp vote in that year I, when I, we had all those bets on nick's tape so I, 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 I definitely agree with that absolutely absolutely and 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 you know I, I think my team has that problem but the net the knicks have an opportunity to kind of bolt those players in in the form of taj gibson um in the form of the young guys who are just getting older under, underneath their tent, who's mm -hmm. who's the keeper uh, of all the signings? Who's the person that the Knicks need to go forward with? Uh, well, for one, like I said, it's definitely Taj. I got to see what Reggie Bullock does when he comes back. I'm not sure um, uh, what he will be. Obviously, he's a 3 and D player. He's a highly efficient three-point shooter. I think his best came when he was on Detroit. I think he shot almost close to 45% from, from downtown. So certainly uh, as we continue to look to space the floor and, and we desperately need consistent three-point shooting, he yes. could be, but we got to see more. I would say right now, again, Julius is, is by default. I think they will let Julius play out the two years, the two or the three at least. Mm -hmm. um, Morris, I would look to trade between December 15th at the deadline if, if we can get back into the first round. Ellington, he's def look he's definitely trade. looking valuable. Like he looks like a guy you yeah. could add to a playoff team that wins. That just his addition gets you through a round that you you might have lost uh, um, without him. I don't think you ever want him sure. to be the centerpiece. Like I, I it, seeing him take the most shots for the Knicks night in night out is is infuriating for me because I think that should just be. The, I think the best investment would be letting the kids do that. But if you could trade him, if you could flip him December fifteenth. Um, uh, I think he has value at, if for like a Utah who right. could look at him and go, all right, I could grab him, you know, you know, unleash him during the game at some point and, uh, and, and, and sneak a couple of rounds, maybe make it to the Western conference final just by having him. Cause he was there to just, you know, uh, tire out, uh, uh, a LeBron who was playing 42 minutes. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think Mars could definitely be a valuable piece for now. I like him here. Don't get me wrong, but again, uh, we still need to be in the asset acquisition phase. And and if we absolutely. can get something formed, then then I would definitely look to trade him. That's that's my um uh, phrase for for Knicks fans: asset acquisition. 
that like all the other stuff is a distraction. The arguments with Richard Jefferson, the press conferences, yeah. all of that is a distraction. What Steve Mills should be on the phone to all thirty, uh, uh, all twenty nine of the other teams is, listen, we are the New York Knicks. We are open for business. Can we help you? Can we make something happen for you? Can do you, you know? Are you trying to liquidate some of your some of your youth for some winning right now? We have <laughs> a full stock uh, cupboard of of players you could use to grind out. I it and and that and that brings us to a great question: Is Randall available December fifteenth? I don't I don't see them doing that as their their prize free and I say that you know almost cracking up here as their prize free agent acquisition uh, and again with a kid with some upside I don't see them doing that I don't I don't see them going back on that and and admitting that it was a I don't see I don't want to grade it as a bad signing because I don't necessarily know if it's going to be a bad signing I just think someone one, offers think you a lottery things. pick do you take it yes or no. Oh, absolutely, no doubt about it. Without hesitation, <laughs> they they probably hesitation. won't. They probably won't no. because you know that's your signature signing. You've got to exactly. be able to show uh, Jim Dolan. Like I, I, I tell this story about Jim Dolan at at the Garden. I always say that he always acts up. Like if you ever go back and look at every time that he's ever acted up in the Garden. It's always because he got he has bitches with him, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. that's and a whole lot, a whole lot. <laughs> Hold on, a whole lot. Uh, I was at summer league, and he and he had a whole row of Victoria's you, Secret bottles. Yeah, you Dolan is not playing. You know he's getting the Jeffrey Epstein hookup. He's going to the yeah. island. Well, you know that's his whole life, and and the thing is. He in his mind, I always and, and that's not my word, bitches. That's what I when I look at when I look at Jim Dolan and he's looking at that fan's face and telling them, um, how dare you tell me to sell him the team? What I hear him saying is, how dare you tell me talk crazy to me in my palace uh, amongst my bitches? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Like, it's true, how, like I like so Dolan true, doesn't man. know he's a trick. He he does. He would never think of himself. As that, even though I know um, uh, he has Jeffrey Epstein on speed dial, when 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 Jeffrey Epstein ended up hung in his cell uh, from apparent uh, suicide, quote unquote, um, I'm sure Jim Dolan uh, breathed a sigh of relief because. Oh yeah, <laughs> I, I understand he's super rich, but he, you know, JD in the straight shots. I don't know if he's a player like that, so. Every time he gets upset, he needs to get out of his way. He needs to get out of Steve Mills' way. Take these L's, you know. You know, go go on tour with with your bitches. Let the team <laughs> do what they gotta what they gotta do just, because just let them marinate, man. Because if you go into asset acquisition mode, the Knicks, even if they start to even look good, players will come here. You just gotta give yeah. someone the confidence, like okay. Like things are stable, they they looking good. They built this nice little team that 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 that's getting close to forty wins. You know, you could do that if you just let this dude Perry do it. I, I, his picks have been good. Give give him fifteen picks over the next three years. I bet you he'll build you a playoff team. Um, well, we we need foundation. We need stability. And uh, again, if you look at it at the micro level, then yeah, it looks looks pretty bad but if you pull back again as you said i think perry's picks have been good we still have all our picks going forward we have the mavericks picks going forward now where those end up we don't know you know luka Doncic is starting to look like a generational talent but we'll see what happens you still have to you know pick the right player and again the, the cap flexibility will continue to be that way going forward so i think from a macro level i think we're, we're right where we need to be I mean, I look at, look at, you know, Philadelphia's turmoil over the past six years. I mean, they had 19 win seasons, 18. They had a 10 win season in 2015, yeah. 28 wins in 2016. All those years, it was, you know, Brett Brown is the worst coach ever. Get rid of him, get rid of him. And now everything is cool, right? They have their prospects, they have their talent. And their Eastern Conference contender, you don't even hear anything about Brett Brown these days. Now everything is okay. 
Look, look at your own situation with the Nets. I mean, after you guys made that mistake with, with, with KG and Paul Pierce and them, I mean, you guys had a 21 seed, couple 21 seasons, three 21 seasons before you guys made it back into the playoffs. So, I mean, no, I mean, it, we, it's a, it's a, pro, it's a process, man. No, I listen with the, with, with the Nets, the Nets had a perfect storm of, of, of a few things that came together and came right. I'm, I'm their biggest critic because, you know, me personally, I feel like you add two superstars, you can't build an irresponsible team around them. You, you like this window is, is this window and, and windows like this shut quick. So, but in, in, in bringing it full circle and comparing it to what the Knicks are doing, my my problem is is not necessarily uh what they're doing it's the tools that they're given i i question if does perry really have the best facilities to be bringing these players on do they have the best scouts are they spending in that way and it's and i don't i don't question perry i think perry has done a good enough job where you can't really question him. The person I question is Steve Mills. So my question to you, CP, can Steve Mills bring you guys out of this based on everything we know? Remember, Steve Mills was a part of this team before Isaiah. So having him been at a high level in the, in the Knicks, running the team, can do you trust Steve Mills to turn this whole thing around? Honestly, I don't. Uh, I mean, just looking at his record <laughs> under uh, this regime as president, I mean, he's about 160 and, and 377 as president wow. of the team. And, and again, he's not a player. He's not the coach. And, and who knows what his direct influence is on, on certain decisions. But your record is what it is and while you're there. I think as long as he – because, listen, there's one thing that we know about Dolan is that – he trusts the people that he trusts, whether it's the hockey side or the basketball side. He's high, He's very loyal. We saw that with Isaiah. We've seen that with Mills. So it, I don't see him, unless unless things just get insanely bad going forward, I, I think Mills will be here. As long as he puts the faith in the scouting team, in the Perry's uh, uh, team, to let them draft the players, let them negotiate the contracts. We don't need any more Tim Hardaway Jr. deals or any Ron Baker deals. You know, that's what Steve Mills did before Scott Perry got here. Yeah. We don't need him signing the contracts, okay? He we just needs to, to – let, let Perry do his thing, man. Listen, just – Steve Mills just needs to be the, the yes and boss – you know, you great, J.D. Like, he needs to be the dude that <laughs> yeah, just it, tells Dolan that he's amazing and he's great and just let Perry cook. Like, I, let Perry cook. Yeah, I, I think I I trust that dude. I, 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 if, if I'm a Knicks fan, my hope is that the, you know, they sell out, uh, they sell out uh, the tour for, um, uh, uh, for JD in the straight shots, that he's so distracted that uh, you know he he doesn't pay attention to the team, and Perry just gets to do what he what he does, because uh, I, I, that's the way out of this. The way out of this is to just go through the process of rebuilding a team. I, I know it's gonna be seven years no playoffs, right? Am I am I right in saying that it's seven years no playoffs? Um, Since Nick State, yeah, you are right. Yep. So I I think. I think everybody just needs to take a deep breath and go, how do we put as many foundational pieces around R.J. Barrett and young players that we trade and rescue? And when they get here, the building, the resources, the, 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 the support system is so good that those young players get to flourish around um, uh, R.J., right? The Knicks Absolutely. can't. The Knicks can't be waiting for exceptional talent to happen. They just have to become like the NASA of 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 NBA basketball, where their facilities, their like they could do it. They have the most money. They, but I think they just believe that, like like Billy King believed. Hey, I just get these Hall of Famers, put them in a gym and roll a ball out there, and they're gonna go and and, and win championships. That's not the way teams are built you have to have that foundational 
operational uh, uh, culture within your organization where the moment those players touch touch ground that that they're gonna grow. Um, and and I say that to say, do you think what is the thing that has to happen to force them to evolve? Like what what and and this is this is our last question by the way, <laughs> mm-hmm. but uh uh what what is that thing like like give us the 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 thing that needs the 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 macrocosm that needs to happen that changes that 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 wakes them up and 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 builds the culture necessary to to move this team forward. Ta- talent wins, man. At the end of the day, when it's all said and done, talent wins. And, and you know the Cleveland Cavaliers didn't win a championship because they had the, you know, a great facility or even a great coach. They won because they had a generational talent in LeBron James, you know, Miami heat. Yes. They had a foundation. Don't get me wrong. But what, what Pat Riley built over there was incredible. Well, they have an amazing hated, organization. But, they build, right, they have an amazing organization, but you know, let's be honest. When you put one of the greatest players ever to play oh, yeah. along with two of the other greatest, it will well, say D Wade, not Chris Bosh, but he was a perennial all-star. Yeah. Those things happen. My, my point is, it's a talent-driven league. We have to get get it right in the draft, and I think RJ's a start. Let's mm-hmm. see what happens this year and, and going forward. We got to get it right and build our own, uh, build our own stars, man. CP, I appreciate you, man. Like honestly, I think this was a great introspective look at 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 uh, the Knicks. Y'all gonna be all right. Uh, I, and I thank you for coming on, man. Anything, uh, anybody you want to shout out? Anybody you want to say uh, what's up to you? Want to plug uh, uh, all of your socials? Um, yeah, man. Um, YouTube.com, Knicks Fan TV. Like I said, this is this the home of the diehard Knicks fan, the number one show for the fans, by the fans. Uh, I'll put our show up there against any uh, in, in you know NBA independent fan base media. Uh, we have a good thing going. We have Nets fans that tune in. We got Nets fans who I'm donate one. to the show. Yeah, I'm exactly. One. You're one of them, so you can attest to it, but... We have several Nets fans that will come in just to watch and, and appreciate our movement and appreciate uh, the content as well. So we, we certainly appreciate the support from fans um, outside of the Knicks. And so uh, just continue to support us, man. Like I said, YouTube.com, Knicks Fan TV. I'm also on Twitter, on Instagram, at under the same name, Knicks Fan TV. And Eves, I, I certainly appreciate you having me on, man, and, and look forward to uh, uh, continued collaborations, man. Nah, man, this is just the beginning for us. Thank you, man. We uh, we appreciate you. New York City has been the front office. Uh, we talk hoop here, and we got to talk with one of the best of them. Talk to you later.